digital economy in Southeast Asia has been very, very rapid, particularly in Indonesia. It has gone through unprecedented speed. And certainly, we don't want to go back with the non-cashless. ATMs are probably going to be gone soon. Everyone is doing transactions via mobile devices. And Indonesia actually places 11th as the largest market of e-commerce with predicted revenue of 45.28 billion US dollars in 2023 and has become the first mobile nation, sorry, mobile first nation where approximately 75% of the online purchases are made via mobile devices. This actually far exceeds the US where platforms have been there for a longer time and more established firmly established compared to Indonesia. So we don't want to go back, definitely. And given the comprehensiveness, let's go to Goto first. You have very comprehensive offerings, definitely, but Hans. And um, we want to know, what does it mean by unleashing the digital economy according to your knowing? Put in simple terms, when we say about unleashing the digital economy, the key words are digital and economy, mm -hmm. obviously. So what it means for us is uh, commerce or activity, economic activity that otherwise would not have happened without digital, without apps, mm. is what we would look to unleash. So for example, uh, when you think about GoCar, it's our transportation service, on-demand transportation service. Mm. I came here by GoCar, by the way. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And there was always a need for mm -hmm. transportation for people to get from point A to point B. And now, through the use of the GoJack app, through digital means, there is now an economic activity. Because more and more people with the need to, to move have now been matched with the people who are able to provide that service. Mm -hmm. Similarly for e-commerce, there are always people who are looking to purchase, and there are sellers. And what an e-commerce tokopedia has, has allowed us to do is to match the buyers and sellers through digital means. Mm. And this is economic activity that is now unleashed through digital means. So any additional economic activity uh, that is coming from, from any digital enablement is how we would uh, classify to be unleashing the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to also mention that there is, uh, there was supposed to be Pat Samuel, Pat Samuel Abriani, Director General of the Minist uh, from the Ministry of Informatics of the Republic of Indonesia. Unfortunately, he could not make it uh, due to his last minute duty to Bali. Um, and also inviting everyone once again to be taking part in this discussion. So scan the barcode and just put your questions there. So. Thank you, Pat Hans. You have laid out what it means by unleashing the digital um, economy. So what do you think the impact would be to the businesses and the consumers? Quite significant. Um, perhaps I'm biased, but if you look just within yeah. the Goto group, uh, some of the research has indicated that we can contribute up to 1% to 2% of GDP for Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I think the story here is not about the Goto group. Right? The story is about what digitization can do to an economy, an emerging economy like Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see, if, if you take a look, we have approximately two and a half million registered drivers. Uh, within Gojek, to, which is GoFood and Tokopedia, we have almost 18 million registered merchants. Mm. And we have, as of last year, 60 million users. Right. And if you think, if you add all of these up, there's a tremendous amount of economic activity that is being unleashed through the matching of buyers and sellers of products and services. So, and again, we see this repeated again and again, also in the fintech space. Um, and, and I believe that the, the, the potential is quite significant. I think one thing that, has, that we have learned is, while there has been rapid uh, growth mm. in the digital space here in Indonesia, um, it, compared to some of the more developed, highly pen digitally penetrated markets, such as China, we still have quite a ways to go. So while the, the growth has been immense, I believe that there is still a, quite a bit more uh, that we can go. Right. Okay. Thank you, Pahans. Uh, now, I would like to go to Ms. Megawati. Ms. Megawati. So just to set the context for, uh, for our audience as well here, um, how crucial is cloud 
in the functioning of a society and business today globally and in Indonesia, knowing that cloud has experiences maybe in our neighboring country like Malaysia, for example, and cloud can play a very important role as well in advancing Indonesia's organizations in its digital transformation, um, environmental, uh, sorry, uh, with the initiatives of digital transformation with the highest level of security, which is also very important, scalability, and not to forget environmental sustainability offered by cloud. So how important is it? Okay. Just scream out loud. All right, okay, hi, <laughs> yeah. uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk uh, in a UOB event. It's actually very exciting for us as Indonesians, right, to host this because it shows the presence, the importance of Indonesia in the ASEAN economy. Mm. And to be frank, one of the things, because I, I actually lead uh, Google Cloud last week while still uh, leading the business for Indonesia and Malaysia, but this week I got promoted. Uh, I'm now uh, running uh, Southeast Asia for uh, uh, channels and strategic partnerships. But one of the things why it happened was actually because of Indonesia. Mm. So if you think about it, and actually at least for Google Cloud context, Indonesia contributes more than 50% of our business in ASEAN. Mm. So if you, if you understand that, that means that if you combine Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, everybody else is still smaller than the Indonesia cloud market. Wow. Mm. That is a very significant fact, okay? I, thank you. But why is it so important? We showed uh, earlier whereby we have a very young generation, right? We talk about 60% of the population is less than 35%. And one of the greatest things that I'm sitting here with Bahan is that GoTo is one of my biggest customer. So if you look at them, right, they focus on your core business, right hailing, GoPay, and the rest of it. But the, the fact that they are putting their workloads on Google Cloud is a showcase of the security, the reliability, and the confidence that they have on cloud. And that, like, I know that a lot of companies, including a lot of banks, they're worried about this of security, compliance, and stuff like that. But we actually have that in Indonesia. So Indonesia, we're able to, be able to grow, and not only because cloud can unleash the innovation that we have. So if you think about it, one of the things that we all of you are looking at possibly, if I can look at the show of hands, may I know how many of the audience here are using Gmail? Gmail? How many of you are actually using Google Map? Google Map? Anyone using Google Map? Yes. Yeah, we, we are lost in this world Think without about Google that. Map. <laughs> How many of you are watching YouTube from time to time? Oh, YouTube. I, I watch daily BTS consumption. all the time. So, okay, so, so if you think about this, nine products and services from Google are used by more than one billion users across the world concurrently. And if you think about that, the reliability, the availability, and security are all there, because otherwise, people will not want to use it. Now, other than that, think about uh, the generative AI phenomenon that we are watching, right? A lot of people, I go to CEOs of companies across the region, and one of the things that's very interesting, it's not an IT problem, it's not an IT uh, topic, it is a CEO topic. Why is that important? Because it's able to create new innovation that have never seen before. So if you look at the era, we talk about Internet as the first era. Second is mobility, right? If you think about it, the mobile apps. A long time ago, some companies, they created Lipo Shop. If you remember, when you're when you mm. old enough, you remember that. But at that time, handphones are not readily available. That's the creation of mobile app. Now mm. everybody is, uh, I, mean, I, I shop in Tokopedia a lot. Yeah, but Hans, yeah, I'm like, like your premium <laughs> yeah. uh, member. But if you, if you think about this, all these stuff are happening because of the availability of computing. So with generative AI, you can even do even more. You're able to generate stuff. So a lot of people ask me, what's the difference of AI and generative AI? A big difference is that you're able to use information that's now available. It can create something new, create new images, new contacts, new, new text, and everything else. And that's why the impact to the society is tremendous. That's why Indonesia becomes a hotbed of a lot of investment a lot of investment for data centers, cloud region. And of course, one last thing if I can add, data is always increasing. It will never go down. So if you want to invest, this is the best time to do it in here, especially in Indonesia. Thank wow, you. okay, so if you want it, you have to invest in Indonesia. <laughs> All right, because IT is a matter of the CEO talks, not lower than that. 
Because it sets the direction, right? Sets the direction. Yeah. And it's very important because once the CEO sets the direction of where the company wants to go, everybody follows. All right. And that actually is a deepening matter, right? Mm -hmm. And right now, because of Gen AI, a lot of people are saying, hey, is this just a concept? Is this just a philosophy? It's not. The use case are already here. We are actually doing a lot of stuff with the local uh, companies. And of course, across the globe, we are also doing it with General Motors, with L'Oreal, and a lot of other companies. So I don't see why Indonesia and a lot of ASEAN countries, and I'm glad that a lot of other people, yeah, other countries come here. I think it's a time whereby we're able to grow and innovate even much faster because we don't have a legacy behind mm -hmm. us. This is the time to do it now. And if we do it right, if we are able to innovate and adopt the right technology, it would guarantee us our growth for the next five to 10 years ahead. Mm -hmm. okay. And ASEAN is the hotbed for innovation. We better listen to Ibu Megawati. I like your vibe, by the way. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ibu. Now, of course, in this transition era, the role of central bank has become very important in adapting into the new situation where newcomers come in. By the way, congratulations, you have launched the e-licensing so that everyone will make it, it will be easy to invest and for the um, every layers of the process as well. But certainly, BI, Bank Indonesia, faces challenges as it has to um, integrate the Indonesia central banking systems as a whole in this changing era. Um, evolution of central banks' policies need to be made, and the digital era becoming challenges in services as well from BI. So what are the BI priorities, but um, seeing all this developing, all the changes in the digital economy? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me also express my gratitude to UOB for having me this afternoon. Talking about uh, digitalization, mm -hmm. for us, the most critical one now is the payment system. So, in 2018, uh, during the new governor, uh, Pak Perry Warjo, was inaugurated at that time, mm -hmm. he thinks how to reshape the payment system in Indonesia to accommodate all those kind of uh, activities from Pak Hans that already mentioned and technology from the uh, Ibu Megawati explained how we reshape our uh, payment uh, system industry. Because all the activities need to be settled by secure and of course reliable payment system. So we launched the blueprint of uh, system, um, system pembayar. We call it uh, blueprint, uh, BSP blueprint system pembayaran Indonesia. Uh, payment system blueprint of Indonesia. Uh, it has outlined all the critical aspects that need to be developed in the five years up until 2025. The most critical one is how to establish the modalities to facilitate all the transactions. Uh, let me also say that we are lucky at that time. Uh, we decide to choose Chris yep. as our game changer in payment system. Mm -hmm. Why we talk uh, uh, about uh, uh, Chris as a, you know, a fortunate uh, instrument that we choose because the technology can provide any kind of uh, uh, possibility to uh, facilitate the payment system. But we choose Chris. Why? Because, first of all, it requires uh, integration between players. And at that time, every single QR already uh, in the market, every bank has their own QR, but they cannot talk each other. Mm. So we launched the uh, QR. Uh, uh, Chris, quick respond, code Indonesian standard. So it must be standardized. Mm -hmm. So it can talk each other. Right. right after it was launched in August 2019, the pandemic hit uh, our country severely. Mm -hmm. We facilitate all the e-commerce transaction, or you know, kind of uh, what we call it, uh, digital transaction mm -hmm. that maybe at that time. Uh, Topopedia and uh, Gojek was the, you know, the market leaders. Mm. 
uh, that need to be facilitated in the uh, you know in the economy. Yeah. That's the first uh, uh, you know uh, fortunate decision that we make. Secondly, Chris also gives the accessibility to the of course small medium enterprise. We're talking about the accessibility to the people in the rural area. Uh, we talk also how to act, you know expand to the uh, you know the dispersed geographical uh, uh, challenge in Indonesia yep. uh, because the potential buyer is not in Java. Yeah. Maybe uh, uh, Pahans can also explain about that. We need to reach out to the remote yeah. area. Mm -hmm. The uh, buying power of the people outside of Indonesia also big. Mm. That uh, uh, from our uh, data. 81% from our data tell that they're under the categories of micro, small, medium enterprise. 81%. And Chris is a kind of, you know, the instrument that provides the uh, high frequency, low value. Mm. So it means that the transaction quite huge, the number of the transactions is quite huge, 70% out of uh, around now uh, 1 billion transaction is for MSME, 81%. Right, right, right. Yeah. But the value is around 30. So it means that they facilitate clearly the uh, people in the, what we call it, in the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. That's the second uh, fortunate uh, that we already uh, uh, identify. Thirdly, now it can be integrated to any kind of system. We are talking the regional payment connectivity around the ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, the first instrument that can be connected is Chris. Chris, yeah. It's already done with the Thailand, Malaysia, and the near future with Singapore. So cross borders. Already. Cross border. And now, our office quite busy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to sort or kind of, you know, to sort or the uh, requirement. Mm that try to connect between other countries. China, India, Japan, mm -hmm. they already see that. The, the effectiveness using Chris in the uh, uh, regional uh, uh, transaction, right. especially for the uh, people uh, in the uh, mobility, as you mentioned, uh, transaction between tourism, MSME, and of course, uh, uh, from the economic activities, uh, we can, uh, of course, adjust. The size of the Chris, it can be really adjust. Right. Now the uh, ceiling is about uh, 10 million rupees. Okay. But mm -hmm. if needed, if needed, it can be increased easily. Right. No problem. As long as you know all the uh, infrastructure uh, uh, provider can agree all right. on, the, uh, uh, on the system. Okay, Pak. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about investments, yeah. as also um, mentioned by Bu Megawati. So, we know that BI is always closely working with Kemenko, the Ministry mm -hmm. of Finance. So, how is the government creating an investor or business-friendly environment in Indonesia and making the investors feeling, you know, like like home when they come here and invest? Okay, my background was a sub banking supervisor. The way that we conduct the supervision in a banking area now is quite different with the you know payment system industry mm. our uh, main pillar in the framework of the uh, blueprint uh, there is three pillars first is growth secondly is stability and the third is inclusion right. when we talk about growth it means that we try to facilitate any kind of investment in the payment system any kind they can be, you know, the front end, they provide the instrument. They can be in the middle end, provide the, you know, a can channel. Right. And they also can be the back end, provide the technology like Abu uh, Megawati. So we invite them based on the principle base, not on base, uh, not uh, based on uh, what we call it, uh, rule base. Mm. If you're talking about banking system, it's all about rule base. All right. Every single activity needs to be supervised and checked. But in the payment system, up until now, we think that principle base is more suitable. Meaning that they can have their own innovation, come to us, we discuss in the sandbox, 
we discuss on the uh, you know in the process try to understand what is the risk what is the benefit the impact to the economy and then they can decide whether it can be launched or not all right and then we also provide a kind of you know uh, facilitation for them mm -hmm. so it means that we are a kind of open market mm -hmm. for the payment system but along the way we also maintain the risk again the stability is about how to measure the risk based on the growth okay. that's uh, 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 our approach to again to make our uh, market conducive all right Padiki, thank you so much now I'd like to go to Terence the very end very far okay so UOB adopts an all value chain approach and to, to banking and technology sector. Could you share where you see the opportunities for investment and growth across infrastructural and service front, maybe with accompanying data to all of us? I think as we look at digital infrastructures or even the digital ecosystem itself, it is actually a very wide and diverse area. And from the perspective of that, if, as a banker itself, looking at such a wide and diverse ecosystem, we need to understand how to break them down into building blocks. And the way we look at digital infrastructure and di digital ecosystem and digital economy is that there are three key building blocks that need, can be defined and that can be supported in a more uh, focused manner. So the very first one is the digital infrastructure. When we talk about digital economy, we are talking about connectivity, we are talking about data communications. We also need to know that how these data are being hosted and managed as well. So we are talking about supporting the cloud computing players, hyperscalers, in their needs of managing such data as well as the connectivity that is required out of this whole uh, build-out of the ecosystems. We will know that there is a need of data centers, and the way they identify data centers requirement is that they will define a cloud region within a certain country, and within the cloud region itself, to identify what is the availability zone. That is to ensure that there is good latency, there is good reliability with regards to what kind of services they are offering. Mm. So when we look, look at digital infrastructures, this is where the bank can actually look at it on a very much more supportive manner because we are a capital provider. We are also be able to enable them to build that kind of infrastructures in the form of design that will support the economy. So from the very baseline, the infrastructure is where we look at to build and support the economy itself. And then we will come up to what we call a platform. A cloud platform, and usually it's being defined as what is a hyperscaler business model. Hyperscalers are what they do in terms of creating a virtual environment whereby businesses, enterprises, and even individuals like us can actually interact inside there and do the things that we want to do. Mm. Hyperscalers like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they have already defined Indonesia as the country uh, that they have determined cloud regions to be built within this country itself. They have done that for many years ago already. And it is not just that. We are also seeing Chinese players, Huawei Cloud, Tencent Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, they are all coming here. Mainly because this Indonesia itself is a very deep and a very large market. You, you will have the opportunity to benefit from the size and the opportunity to create scopes out of that with regards to digital services and the, the kind of value add that you can add on. So as we understand how hyperscaler design their infrastructure as well as how they are able to um, work with the enterprises to be able to help them in their digitalization journey, you will see that that's where they become the center of the ecosystems. We as a FI, as a bank itself, we are also a stakeholder in that digital ecosystems. We always look at opportunity that we can partner with Hyperscaler to really look at the win-win propositions that we can do as a partnerships. We have our own network. We have our own capability with regards to financial services and product that can enable Hyperscalers to ensure that their adoptions of their environments and their services and their network to the enterprises and all the way down to the consumers. So this is how we look at in terms of pairing that together. Besides the supplier in terms of infrastructures, mm. how, do we, how do we look work with them to go into downstreams in terms of the enterprise clients as well as consumer clients if you need to. So as we see GoTo, there is a very strong platform. And we can also see that besides the Western hyperscalers and the China's hyperscalers, 
is coming into Indonesia itself, we also see a lot of unicorns that is being built up and created, a very strong unicorn that is, that is already established here in Indonesia itself. Yeah. GoTo is one of the largest, and uh, there are others as well. It's, it is all because Indonesia itself is a very deep and very large market that actually okay. can harness their potentials for such platform to, to reap the best benefits of it. Right. We as a bank will want to, want to support that. Thank and you. right down to the last layer, yeah. which is oh. the enterprise. Oh, yeah. We are talking about applications like Zoom, mm -hmm. like um, you know, payment systems. These are all that is needed to interface with the business processes of the enterprises, as well as the operations processes. That's where we are trying to work with some of these application service providers to en enhance the adoptions of sub-services in the enterprise um, sustainability journey, as well as digitalization journey. Mm -hmm. So that's how we will go about doing it. Okay. That. But Terence, thank you so much. Now, we see now the world is digitally convergent. So I'd like to go back to you, Pak Han. So what um, can the businesses do to actually plug into the digitally convergent world as you see it right now? Well, all the mul it's multi-platforms. Everything is being used. So what do you think the businesses can actually plug into and how? Sure, thank you very much. I think before I respond to that, I just would like to um, share a few thoughts, react to what Pagliki has mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And I see this from the point of view of a market player. Right? I think what we found to be very helpful um, coming from the regulator, in this case, the central bank, is are two things. One is the clarity of the roadmap moving to the future. Chris, as Padiki has mentioned, has been shared. Um, of course, it was launched in 2019, but the socialization and discussion happened before that. And not only that, right, but there's no BI fast and so on and so forth. So there's a very clear roadmap of what the central bank wants to do in terms of the payment systems of the country. As a market player, I find it to be extremely, extremely helpful. Because the one thing that is uh, helpful for us is clarity and certainty. And so far, the Bank of Indonesia has been quite consistent in implementing this massive blueprint. Thank you. The second thing I'd like to appreciate, um, again, not just because Padiki is here, uh, is that the, the SLA with the regulator is very clear. And uh, from my understanding, this has taken a lot of effort. But uh, you know, recently, uh, earlier in the year, the, the Bank of Indonesia has set very clear SLAs on the response times for some of our applications and approvals. Game changer, because with that, uh, what it brings for us as a market player is, is certainty and clarity right, mm -hmm. of timing. Now, coming back to your question, yeah. if I look at Indonesia, okay, the question is, so what can market players do to bring in to jump onto the, the digital ecosystem in Indonesia? Yeah. Yeah. Let me start with just a few facts. So, Indonesia has 270 million population. I think everybody knows that of which the research states that there are 190 million Indonesians who are in the productive population. Mm -hmm. So that is really the addressable market. 190 million people is the addressable market. But you multiply that with two other factors. The first is that the GDP of Indonesia per capita is now in the mid-4,000s. If we continue a certain rate of growth, we will hit the magical 5,000, 6,000 limit over the next decade. That's when really, um, as proven in many other countries, there's sufficient disposable income mm -hmm. where all of the, the, the services uh, that we market players would like to provide will find consumers. So we're, we're not that far away mm -hmm. from that critical watershed GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. Now, you multiply that again with another fact, which is you know, based on recent research, that it says that, uh, this is amazing stat, I was quite shocked when I saw this, it says that for the average Indonesian aged between 16 to 64 years old, they spend a stunning seven hours, or more than seven hours a day okay. on their phones, right, on their mobile devices. Guilty as charged, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and of course, smartphone penetration is 99.4%, essentially mm -hmm. actually 100%. Wow. So when you zoom out, what mm -hmm. we have is we have a large addressable population of 190 million, mm -hmm. and this, addressable population is reaching 
5,000, 6,000 GDP per capita, where their demands and needs will be unlocked. And the way that they prefer to consume information or to consume our products and services is clearly through the phone. Because mm -hmm. they're spending seven hours a day on it. Mm -hmm. So I think these are some of the macro uh, st statistics that, that we, uh, we should consider how to plug into. Um, speaking, oops, sorry. Speaking for, for a fintech space, because I'm, I'm in the Goto Financial, we think about this a lot. We think about how can we enable this next wave of this young population who are digitally savvy on how we can tap on to serve their needs. Mm. I think the biggest question here that I would, biggest learning I would say, mm. in terms of how to tap this market, is not to start off with saying, what is it that we can provide? But flip it around and say, who are, who are these users and what do they want? Yeah. It sounds very cliche, but it's very true. Mm. One example, uh, GoPay, uh, we launched our standalone payments app in July of 26 this year. Prior to that, we have been, always been an embedded payment use case inside the Gojek application and inside the Tokopedia application. Mm -hmm. I can tell everyone here that the GoPay app that we ended up launching in July is quite a bit different from what we had envisioned. Mm. We ended up with an app that was significantly decontented. Uh, it is a much smaller app. It's one third to one quarter the size of the GoJack app or the, or the Tokopedia app. Mm -hmm. And it had very basic services that were easy because that's what the consumers wanted. When we were starting the drawing board, we had all kinds of fancy ideas, right? What's happening in the world? What are the best practices from the various different countries mm -hmm. that we wanted to bring into Indonesia? Mm -hmm. When we went to do the market research, including part to tier two cities, mm -hmm. tier three cities, uh, the response was very clear. Like, what, what do I need this for? Mm -hmm. So it really forced us to reevaluate and we need to understand that even as being a local player in Indonesia, we have our own biases. Mm. We sit in Jakarta, we sit in South Central Jakarta, and the way to find product market fit with what we are trying to provide to the market is not by pushing, but really trying to understand what exactly is going on on the ground and how we need to tailor our services accordingly. I think that's a very, very valuable lesson that we have learned. Mm -hmm. Hope that helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pahans. Um, very interesting. So now we see the growth is at an unprecedented level. And Indonesia with the um, very productive age coming in as well. Now I'd like to go to Ibu Megawati though. So Ibu, you, where do you see the uh, growth opportunities? Right in in ASEAN of cloud in ASEAN and in Indonesia, is there any particular industries or application, data unification and generative AI, for example? Maybe you can share some experiences sure. from you. other countries. So I think one of the things that we found there are three areas. So first is data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you look at how data is being used. It's not about storage anymore. It's not about putting some, some data in, in some warehouse. That's not the best use of data. Yeah. The best use of data is to see what you have done and use that to extrapolate for future trends, future prediction. Yeah. So the data analytics capability has increased dramatically. Everybody wants to know about how their production is going, what's the supply chain, how's the delivery, are we on time, how's the customer service experience. All this information, a long time ago, is stored somewhere, and nobody touches it. Right. But the, the, the best way is that use this data, try to refine it, and try to see how we're able to make better service level for our end customer. So that's number one, okay? And even more so in Indonesia, or maybe across Southeast Asia, you see a lot of conglomerates. Do you find that maybe some of you are here in this audience, whereby you have so many entities, every, so many companies, you have end user within each company, but do you know how to use those customer information and to drive new business model by combining all this customer data in a unified data platform, mm. right? Because it actually is all there already, but people are not using it, not leveraging it. So data analytics is one. Secondly, when you have a huge data sets, 
that's available, people now try to build center of excellence. Then the next step to what you're saying is the generative AI. Generative AI must have some basis, because you cannot create something for nothing, right? So from there, then you're able to do generative AI. Something that I want to share uh, specifically maybe for banking. I mean, now that we're in front of UOB, right? One thing that's interesting is that there's no such thing about target audience anymore. Because a lot of times when we do not know in, uh, intimate customer information or know your customer, people are trying to say, okay, this is a custom profile, this is the demographics, this is a location, this is a job. However, this is a time whereby increased personalization is even more important. So right now, what we say is not our segment for teenagers or for working people, it's a segment of one. Segment of one. And that's actually very defined and in terms of a hit rate, it's much, much higher. I also have a joke, right? People, when you look at a mobile app, you have icons in that. But do you know the young people, they don't click on that anymore? They swipe, right? They have a swiping culture. Yeah. They have a three-second attention span. That's it. And if you want to tap into this young generation, if you're not adapting to how they behave, you will lose that audience. And that's the audience of the future. The last but not least, when you have all this data, the, the first thing that you need to think of is the security. Please do not have all this data and make it so vulnerable. You've mm. seen that in many cases. I read, you've seen like the casino in Las Vegas, all this ransomware, that's happening. When you have a lot of information, people will try to attack. So the last thing that we see that's very critical up there in many, many companies' uh, uh, mind is security. Making sure that you have all this information but it's not being attacked or you're not under ransomware. So these are the three areas that we see very big right now. In terms of the industry, to answer your question, I see a lot of demand from financial industry, whether it's traditional banks or like fintechs. Okay? So these are the two areas, and each is trying to accelerate the adoption. And in Indonesia and across Southeast Asia, we talk about financial inclusion. How are you able to include new customers without building a bank, without mm -hmm. a branch. Those are the things that you need to do. And how are you able to provide that access? So that's on the financial industry. Then we talk about manufacturing, talk about retail, you talk about logistics. The, it's actually across. And all, all these industries we can see are being touched by technology in many, many ways. So this is the time to leverage the innovation and tap on in the potential of these industries. All right, well said. Thank you very much, Ibu Megawati. So now let's use the remaining minutes to actually answer the questions uh, from our audience. Thank you very much for the enthusiasm and the participation. Let's have number one question here. Most understand the potential of a digital economy, but likewise the complexity of regulating it. This is from Adil Drouaj from JC Group. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Um, we are now making sure we have in place regulations that won't impede the speed of growth. Can we have yeah. Tiki to yeah. answer this? Okay. Thank you so much for the question. This is really a uh, challenging question, actually. Yes. Again, when we try to regulate the payment system, we use the different approach with the banking system, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before. When we talk principle based, it means that same product, same activities, same risk, same regulation. So we need to understand every single transaction yeah. that can be done by the industry. Mm. Meaning their product, their activity, their behavior. Mm -hmm. Then we apply the same risk management. Mm -hmm. We apply also same kind of you know, approach when you know, we do some examination. We do the uh, random check. We try to identify the behavior. We collect all the data. Let me also using uh, Ibu Megawati explanation about data. What is the beauty about the uh, digital payment system? Mm. Is data. We can collect, uh, you know, the any kind of transaction data. In the near future, if you see our blueprint, we try to establish the payment ID, meaning that. Every single transaction can be tracking to the originate, you know, players that uh, make the, uh, not, not the player, the person 
hmm. then make a transaction. Hmm. Meaning that every single person in Indonesia can be tracking uh, uh, what kind of behavior that they, you know, uh, uh, using their uh, uh, instrument uh, for the payment system. Like Pahans, maybe uh, he likes to go to, uh, let's say, Senayan Mall, go to the golf court. Hmm. We can track hmm. every single transaction that Pahans using okay. the you payment instrument, <laughs> we can, you know, track. Yeah. Uh, again, with using the, uh, uh, we have a Dukcapil. Dukcapil hmm. is a kind of, you know, the uh, central data for the uh, people in Indonesia. Yep. So meaning that we can track any single, uh, you know, people that uh, 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 do the transaction in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So it's important like uh, uh, Bu Mega explained, we will use AI to analyze what kind of, uh, you know, uh, information that can be accepted from the uh, uh, database. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the way that we also place in regulation mm -hmm. to understand about, again, the growth, but of course, we need to maintain the stability mm -hmm. at the same time. All right. Thank you, Pak Diki. Now, um, we have the next question here from Anonymous, very shy person, but having question. Agree on the cloud needs on benefits, but on the thing we do have enough data centers to accommodate the cloud needs. Do we have enough data centers to accommodate the cloud needs? If so how big is the gap and how much more we need? I guess Ibu Mega will answer this. Okay, sure. All right, I think in terms of the capacity, the availability, what we need is actually the availability in the country. But to be frank, the, the idea about cloud is all up there. There is no limit to how much you're able to put on the cloud. There's no such thing. So it's very different when you talk about public cloud and your own data center. Mm. So some of you may have your own server room or data center. You will think about when you want to launch a new application. A lot of times your IT people will say, hey, I need to do this, the capacity, the sizing, and I need to purchase a certain size of servers and need to prepare the network. When you talk about cloud computing, you take away that problem because that will be provided to you without any limit. To be frank, for example, we work a lot with GoTo. They have uh, promos. Last time you have 10, 10, 11, 12, 12. When they tell us today, hey, I'm going to have a promo, for example, mm -hmm. not only tomorrow, this afternoon, we can provide that computing power already. Mm -hmm. That's how limitless and elastic that can be. In addition to that, that means you put that as a variable cost, right? When you don't need that, you can cut, you can, you can save that cost. So with that in mind, actually, there is no such limit that in the conventional way. And that's why we always recommend it. And I hope Padigit uh, uh, is able to yes. support, right? Okay. From Bay E, right? Yes. Because if we're able to have a much more cloud-friendly regulation, it would unleash a lot of potential mm -hmm. that's actually required by the innovation, and that's actually can be only be provided by cloud computing. So there's no limit. So don't worry about that. You just call Google Cloud, I will give you my number. You tell me today, I will provide it you this afternoon. Take her number, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess we have to sum up this session. So indeed, Indonesia still need to foster its uh, dynamic with highly skilled and inclusive digital society and to accelerate, but thank you very much, Bank Indonesia, for having the evolution as well and trying to be relevant to this very changing situation. And also we've seen how this can open opportunities from the business and the market players sure. as well, and the importance of having clouds, because it's not only a matter of storage, but also what can we do with the data that we have. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Pak Diki, Pak Hans, Ibu Megawati, Pak Terence or Mr. Terence, thank you.